Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome to Night Fright. Folks, tonight we're continuing with the JFK assassination. It's November, and as you know, every November we do the whole month with JFK researchers, witnesses, etc., the, all the top-notch folks right here on Night Fright. Now, tonight we continue with that. We're going to look at the possibilities tonight of the CIA's involvement with the JFK assassination. That's right, folks. Were they involved? Now, a good way to start off with that is precedent. Was there indeed any assassinations that took place before the JFK assassination for international, even domestic assassinations? And we're going to look at that tonight with none other than Larry Hancock. Larry Hancock, folks, as you know, has been on this show before. None better, folks, when it comes to the JFK assassination. Don't go anywhere. Sit in your comfy chair. Put your feet up. Get the coffee going. Get the juice going. Get the tea going. If you're driving across the country, ease off the gas pedal ever so slightly. We're going to take you on one heck of an investigative journey tonight, folks, right here on Night Fright. Strap in. Hang on. Here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome. To Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, folks. Welcome. Welcome to Night Fright. I'm your host, Brent Holland. Tonight, as I said at the outset, we continue with the JFK assassination the whole month of November and we're going to be looking at the possibilities tonight of the CIA's own involvement as you know the rumors have been abound for years that perhaps just perhaps the CIA was involved with the JFK assassination on a conspiratorial realm we're going to be looking at that with none better than a JFK researcher, a friend of mine, Larry Hancock. Larry, I want to welcome you back to the show. And by the way, folks, his book is called Someone Would Have Talked, and you can get that at the www.nightfrightshow website. Just click on the book cover. That'll take you right to a place where you can get it. Larry, how are you, my friend? I'm doing fine this evening, Brent. Good to be back. It's great to have you back as well. Now, this is something that you know, the CIA, we've all seen the movie by now, JFK. It's been on the History Channel umpteen times. Indeed, uh, part of the premise of that was, in fact, that there was government uh, involvement in a conspiratorial level. Uh, I've had Mark Lane on the show. Certainly, he believes that the CIA was involved uh, on various levels. What have you found out in your research? I know you have a new book coming out. Uh, specifically covering CIA involvement in international and, God forbid, domestic assassinations as well. What have you found out in terms of precedent that people looking at the JFK assassination can look to and say, ah, there's a template that could have been used in Daily Plaza, November 22nd, 1963? I, I think I found, as, as usually I find, it wasn't exactly... The history is not exactly the way people conceive it in terms of the CIA supporting assassinations. Uh, there's no doubt that the CIA has been involved with assassinations abroad. Uh, that's a matter of record. That's been investigated by congressional committees. Testimony's been taken. It's fascinating how the CIA distances themselves from those sorts of things. It's uh, one of the things I talk about in the, the forthcoming book is the kind of language that they use to distance themselves. In some instances, admitting it was people that they were working with, but they really weren't CIA employees. Admitting that they used CIA weapons, but they really didn't give them to them for that purpose. 
uh, admitting admitting everything except you know the direct dotted line connection and the wording that you find in the congressional reports is fascinating and in terms of how they distance themselves uh, obviously there are lawyers working for them <laughs> <laughs> to keep them safely on the side of the law quote unquote Larry could you do me a favor could you move your microphone just a little bit closer to your mouth my friend and while he's doing that I'm going to tell you who we're speaking with folks Larry Hancock's our guest tonight. He's got a book called Someone Would Have Talked. Easy way to get this book, folks, as well as all the products that our guests come on and uh, have available for you. www.nightfrightshow.com. www.nightfrightshow.com. Just running across here right now. Just click on the book cover associated with tonight's guest. That'll take you right to a place where you can order the book, the DVD, the video, whatever it is from the comfort of your own armchair and tonight's a great night to settle in and listen folks because this is real life history we're talking about tonight we're talking about the JFK assassination we're looking at potential probable CIA involvement and we're starting off we're looking at some of the research Larry has recently done um, on precedent for CIA involvement in assassinations let's go back to Larry now Larry where did you start off? I mean, uh, the CIA, what's the history of the CIA? They started off uh, just after the Second World War as another agency then became the CIA? That, that's, that start off really the start is in 1946, 1947. Uh, at the start of really the national security, uh, the evolution of the national security apparatus in response to the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, basically, if you look at the start, it, there's a very interesting start. At the end of World War II, the Joint Chiefs uh, did some said some very in-depth studying of what a war with atomic weapons would be like and actually determined that there was no way to win a war with atomic weapons if you were attacked first. It just simply wasn't doable. And one of the conclusions, and they published this report internally, obviously it was confidential, was that the only way that you could protect yourself was to have a level of intelligence collection, uh, a level of security that we had never done before, that no one had done before. You would have to know so much about your enemy that there would be no way that your enemy could preempt, that you you literally couldn't allow a first atomic strike against you because there was no defense. And that percolated through the the political apparatus and really led to the conclusion that we had to have a level of national security, national intelligence, a central intelligence agency that unlike anything we'd ever had before. You couldn't really, up to that point in time, the military services, the Army, the Navy, uh, had done a lot of their own military intelligence. The FBI had done domestic intelligence. But the conclusion was that would just not work in an atomic environment. And You know, I was going to say, by the way, folks, our guest tonight, Larry Hancock, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's uh, guest book cover, and that will take you right to a place where you can order this book. Uh, someone would have talked uh, right online. We're talking about the JFK assassination and CIA involvement. You know, on the surface, Larry a central gathering, uh, a central intelligence agency for gathering of information um, doesn't sound as sinister as we have come to connotate the CIA with. It sounds like a logical thing to do, especially uh, in a potential uh, Cold War, in the Cold War situation where you have the potential for a nuclear holocaust. Uh, given the fact that you're right out of the Second World War and we saw the dominoes fall one after another with Hitler and the Nazis, this seems to be a normal extension. Where did they get off track? Where they got off track, I think, really was a- another decision. Once they had organized, once the CIA was authorized, and once they were began to divide up their task, was that they realized that to do their job, they had to have an operational element. You, you, there was so, only so much intelligence you could collect passively. Uh, and there are several types of intelligence collection, signals intelligence. But to get the really good stuff, you had to have access to the enemy's codes, And they probably weren't just going to hand those over to you. You had to have access to their 
people and sometimes they wouldn't just volunteer to give you access. So it became clear that you were going to have to do covert things to get the kind of information you really needed uh, that just wasn't in the public domain nor, nor that you could collect through observation. And so the operations division was created to go out and do those sorts of things, sometimes simply covert, sometimes paramilitary. Uh, and that's where things started to go wrong. I, I think it's interesting. I think most of us who have studied this case um, have heard of a, a CIA officer named Bill Harvey, William Harvey. Can you and, give a brief, uh, bra- a brief, bra- a brief, bra- <laughs> a brief background. Uh, forgive me, folks. I'm a little hungry. Obviously, <laughs> can you give a little bit of a background about William Harvey and J.M. Wave? William, William Harvey had come over from uh, the FBI to the CIA early on. Worked in Germany. One of the key stations for the the CIA early on was in Germany, as you can imagine. The obvious target were the Russians. The closest point of contact would be East and West Germany. The Berlin operating base, which became the Berlin station, was a key point for collections against Eastern Europe and the Russians. And Bill Harvey was at Berlin base and was in charge with collection of information and actually later on came back to Langley and at headquarters to do those sorts of things too. But he ran, ran a group and part of that group's charter was to collect information. They worked with the NSA uh, and but what you would think off the bat is well okay how does that get to be forceful? How, you know is this just not tapping lines and placing bugs and that sort of thing? Well when you started looking at some of the things that they had to do they actually had to crack safes, they had to do break-ins, they had to kidnap couriers and because one of the, as I said, one of the things that quickly comes out is the people you're opposing aren't just going to give you their code books. You've got to go get them. And uh, so that Harvey became a specialist in that sort of thing, which who do you use to do that sort of thing? Do you turn to the, the intelligence analyst in that next cubicle that's out of Harvard? No, you probably don't. You need to go recruit some people that know how to do that. Now, Larry, is is this still just post, just right after the Second World War that all this is taking place? Late uh, late forties, early fifties. So right. that's so under it, it is post war. Okay. Right. Now, Truman and then early Eisenhower. Where did they make the leap from doing these covert operations, which? Okay, they're not nice, uh, obviously, if you're doing it to a foreign government. But, you know, given the context of what has just taken place, as I said before, in the Second World War, given the context of the Cold War, um, and certainly the Soviet bloc was, let's face it, under Stalin, uh, geez, not the the happiest of folks uh, in any terms, and a tyrant in his own right. So I can understand and actually justify a CIA, a CIA covert ops doing that. Where do they make the leap into preemptive assassinations? Where they made the leap actually was when communist expansion began to move outside of Eastern Europe nice. uh, into Africa and then especially into Latin America. Uh, as long as it was in Eastern Europe, it could remain nasty. You could have political battles in Greece you know east and west could take out others candidates but where it really started to to escalate as far as CIA operations to a large scale was in Guatemala in 1954 and 1955 Guatemala was perceived as being the first place that the communist revolution was going to actually be exported to the Americas and it had a very leftist leaning president, a very strong communist uh, organization in the country, and the Eisenhower administration felt that if they got the foothold there, uh, that now, now, we're in, now we're in the Americas. And that's where they essentially went to the CIA and said, well, enough of collecting information. You guys need to do whatever you need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen. And that's where operations moved to what's called regime change. That's a nice sanitized name for it. Now, 1952, is uh, is that correct when Eisenhower came to power, or am I off there? Right. Okay. Right. Now, uh, 
folks, just to let you know, we're speaking with Larry Hancock, and I'm gonna, I got to mention this right away, or I'll forget it. President Nixon, as you all know, who was the vice president in the under or under um, Mr. Eisenhower in those days, and we're going to talk about him a lot with the CIA. <laughs> Trust me on that one. Larry's book is called "Someone Would Have Talked." Triple W dot Night Fright Show. Dot com. Just click on the book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can order it from the comfort of your own home. And uh, tonight's a perfect night to do that, folks, because uh, he's done an astounding, outstanding job on uh, his research. He's one of the premier researchers on the JFK assassination. And indeed, we're talking about some of his newer research, which is going to accumulate in a new book he's bringing out. And he'll be back um, to promote that book as well. But I want to give you a little bit of a taste Uh, before the book is actually published and out there. And we're talking about the potential for CIA involvement with the John Kennedy assassination. That's right, November 26, 1963. I did it again, November 22, 1963. And uh, the beauty of it is, Larry, when when you're dyslexic, you get your your own age mixed up, you know. And at my age, (laughs) that's a good thing, trust me. Um, All that to say, folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. Now, 1952, Eisenhower, completely different America than it is today, completely different. As I said, uh, the Second World War, I think, plays a bigger part in the creation of the CIA. And then all of a sudden, because, you know, the the dominoes fell. And uh, the dominoes fell because of the appeasement in, in Munich, without question. Nobody wanted to appease the Soviets, but you want to try and avoid a nuclear holocaust at the same time. So, of course, you're going to do covert operations. It's only natural. And I'm sure the Soviets were doing them right here in the Western Hemisphere. But all of a sudden now, mentioned dominoes before, you're starting to see the dominoes start to fall a little bit in Latin America. All of a sudden, they're no longer over there. They're right here in this hemisphere. And we're going to jump into Cuba in a few seconds. So how did this progress? How was the first assassination set up, that template put into place, and the action actually um, put uh, taken care of? Well, the amazing thing is that we actually know, because we are talking about covert operations and documents that are normally sealed. And so to, to answer a question like that is really kind of amazing. And if it had not been for the church committee and the documents they collected, we wouldn't know. Uh, But what they actually found when they started doing their investigation is the and the CIA, there is a report of this. The documents are all available online. The CIA did investigate their own activities in Guatemala. And the amazing thing is that they found memos. Now, what will be different between Guatemala and everything after Guatemala is they stopped writing memos. (laughs) No more paper trail. Yeah, no more emails. It's it's kind of like that. No, we don't send emails anymore. No, we uh, it's all. But it, which is in truth. But we actually find memoranda and memoranda, and not just within the CIA, but meetings with State Department officials, CIA yeah. officials, talking about what they're going to have to do to bring about this regime change in Argentina. And they talk about assassination. Uh, they. What happens is they start, uh, how do you bring about regime change? Well, you have to work with some revolutionaries, some expatriates, some exiles. You know, you can't, since we're not going to do this by just sending in the Marines, you have to find somebody in country or close to being in country who can be your surrogate. And that is the pattern from, from then on for the next 50 years is you have to find surrogates. And you work with them, you tie yourself to them, and to some it, extent you become wed to what they want to do because they're going to be the people that really do it and what we see there is they immediately propose that the quickest and easiest way to overthrow the regime is to act assassinate not only the president of the country some of his key cadre some of the key communist uh, supporters in the country and they come up with a whole list and the CIA being helpful says well, you know, we have all sorts of intelligence. We'll give you an approved list. So the CIA goes back to them and says, well, if we really wanted to do this, if if you really wanted to do this, not we, but if you really wanted to do this, here's the list. And this is, this is the first instance of what becomes known as a blacklist. 
and that term will become fairly common. Uh, it's black because it's dark uh, in me at many levels, but these are the people that you need to take out if you're going to make that regime go away. And it proceeds, and the agency again hands off a lot of this to their surrogates, and they, they train the people, they put the people in touch with uh, other anti-communist leaders in surrounding countries and and one document even talks about how they'll simply go to the dictator next door and in return for his eliminating some of his opponents that happen to be in the first in Guatemala he'll lend them uh, 50 pistoleros to do the assassinations inside Guatemala so. and so a lot of the deals are brokered uh, outsourced but, one of the things that you will never find is this will never be done by CIA officers or CIA employees. Even from the very beginning, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, what, you, what you see in the movies is not the way it really happens. It really happens. Larry, who would, who would press the button and say go? Um, I'm thinking of plausible deniability. Would it be a direct order coming from the president at that point, Eisenhower? Would he say, you know, we should really do something about this and then kind of walk away from it and expect Nixon to pick up the reins and run with it? Exactly. Or? What happens is at the highest levels, the president, or in Guatemala, we even find in the congressional record, congressmen talking about, well, we need to do whatever we have to to make sure the country doesn't go communist. Now, what does that mean? You know, that that's... But then the further you down the line you get, people have to get results. So the president can, can make general statements of, you know, authorizing a project, off, authorizing covert operations. But when you get down to the project field officers, then the field officers are the ones who make the final decisions on what they encourage and what they don't. Uh, Nobody. We we only know of one instance in which a president appears to have literally said, "Kill someone." Would it? Can you give us that example? Eisenhower and Lumumba. Really. And the Congo. The, really, he made the direct connection there. You know, I want to bring an analogy to this, a modern analogy. But first, folks, I want to tell you we're speaking with and what we're talking about tonight. We're speaking with one of the premier researchers in the JFK assassination conspiracy. Larry Hancock. He's got a book out called Someone Would Have Talked. Easy way to get this book, www.nightfrightshow.com, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover associated with tonight's guest. That'll right take you to a place, to a, a place online where you can order the book from your own home. Now, Larry, uh, I want to go back to Larry now. I want to talk about bin Laden and try and build a... a, a, a a modern analogy to somehow I, I uh, you know I connotate those days of the CIA they had the best of intentions but certainly uh, they were way off base but now I bring it up forward to today's modern day when we took out Ben Laden we took out Ben Laden um, President Obama obviously greenlighted the seals to go in and, and take care of him would that have been any different in the mind of Eisenhower? Did he see Lumumba as a potential threat, a direct threat to the United States? Because don't forget, he, folks, I just want to reiterate again, you know, President Eisenhower was in charge of the whole European theater during the Second World War. He was privy to stuff that we probably still don't know. How do you feel about it, that, Larry? It's an interesting question. I really see bin Laden and what's happened in the last decade as being qualitatively different because I see that in virtually a declared war, war environment. I mean, uh, it this is a war. Yeah. The They declared war on the U.S., the U.S. responded. Any military commander in that, you know, it is, it's fair game. I mean, you're giving orders for attacks, then you become fair game. I see that as a combat situation. Um, Certainly Guatemala wasn't the same thing. Lumumba in the Congo, it's hard to say what Eisenhower was thinking at that point in time. Eisenhower certainly was was a military commander and thought in those terms and would always have thought in how to get 
the best results with the least you know damage collateral damage everything else but it one of the tricky things is he didn't from what we understand he didn't actually what he said was is that Lumumba has to go we have ta a statement from a person who was in the room at the time and this was again taken uh, that it was clear to everyone in the room what that meant that we had to be you know we had to do what was necessary to take him out as the leader now does that what did Eisenhower really have in mind we, we can't know but the reason I say that that's the only instance where we know that a president has specifically said remove a foreign executive that that's the only instance that we know of we don't know what he meant by remove and it's it's sort of fascinating because there were a lot of communications after after that point between CIA headquarters and the off the officer in the Congo but when the T, the CIA's technical support uh, person Sidney Gottlieb show, showed up in the Congo with poison to actually place with Lumumba and kill him the field officer was astounded because he had not interpreted the instructions at all as an assassination he thought they just meant kidnap him get him out of the country so you can run into a huge amount of confusion as to what get rid of means and that's something I go to great lengths in in my book because statements that are made in Washington DC in staff meetings between senior officers there can be a world of difference between what happens there and what happens in the field the interpretations yeah I guess that's what I was getting at um, you know as you say for, from one thing to another remove somebody to the point where he's assassinated and taken right out of the picture is that was that the connotation that uh, was coming from that order or was it just a simple just get him out of power uh, and that's where we're going to go now. Folks, Larry uh, Hancock's our guest tonight. None better, folks. JFK assassination and the CIA we're talking about tonight. Larry's got a book out called Someone Would Have Talked, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a place where you can order this book online from the comfort of your own home. You know, it's a great night, folks, just to settle in, relax, get the coffee going, get the tea going still got at least a half an hour left if you're just joining us and uh, we're talking about JFK and the CIA we're continuing along uh, this November with our JFK special as we do on Night Fright every November Larry um, let's jump to Cuba oh, actually you know what I'd like to do is talk I want to ask you about Iran because we're in a hell of a quagmire right now with Iran and in my mind the taking out of Mozambique uh, all the, all those years ago led to, of course, bringing the Shah in. The Shah in was nothing but a puppet, a tyrant. Um, uh, you know, I'm very close to the Iranian community here, folks. Uh, very, very close um, here in Canada. And uh, he was no great shakes either, the Shah, you know. And then all of a sudden, 1979, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini comes in and uh, all hell breaks loose in Iran. But I think... What happened in Iran began going back to the 50s. Can we talk a little bit about that, what happened and the coup that took place there? One of, one of the earliest successes, the two earliest successes for the CIA in doing regime changes were in Guatemala and in Iran. And uh, I, I give Iran's a good example. But in, in all of those cases, the interesting thing to keep in mind was the concern never was to put in a better government or to put in a good government the concern always was to maintain influence over the government that was there or the government that you wanted in power it was strictly a power question we didn't change regimes or support regimes for idealistic reasons we did it for control reasons and, and a control reasons to block the soviet expansion bingo Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. Now, uh, you know, as I said, we ended up with that. Uh, can you give just a little brief synopsis about what took place in, in Iran, just for the folks that are listening right now that may not be aware? Uh, Iran was, the, was the, again, a, a perfect model of those early days. Iran was another instance of finding people in the military, in particular, who would support you, finding people who were out of power that would support you, 
and working with them as your surrogates. You know, without, without going into, into detail, we find that over and over again because you are always looking for especially outlets into the, the military infrastructure or the religious or political infrastructure of the country who are not, you know, just as with the communist revolution, this would be from the other side. And you would support them and they would do the whatever was required. In that case, it was, uh, in, in most all cases, there was some assassination involved. They give you an example from Iran. We have uh, the church committee actually documented examples of authorizations to poison Iranian military officers who weren't supportive of our candidate. And uh, it, it's interesting, and the, and the church committee found that, and it involved poison was very frequent. And I think we don't, we, again, the movie images that you see for the CIA assassinations usually have these, you know, very mysterious sniper types running around with sophisticated sealed weapons. They really did like poison a lot better than that. Uh, and the TIA, CIA's technical support division began working. They didn't, unlike James Bond, you know, these guys did not work with the fancy cars, those sorts of things. They worked a lot with chemicals, incapacitating chemicals, chemicals for interrogation, chemicals for poison. And that was the preferred, that was the preferred technique. It was not heavy weapons. Uh, Interesting. And one, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons for that is that you're, whether it be Iran or Guatemala, you're working in, in denied environments. Mm. You know, so it gets to be really, really obvious, you know, if you're walking around with a weapon or something like that, that's why, you know, the poisons were so much more desirable. And, uh, something that we just barely touched on you want to get information from people so interrogations are very very important hostile interrogations are very important you need the right kind of chemicals to do that and as the CIA started with incapacitating and interrogation chemicals before they actually got into poisons it just sort of evolved but I'm off track from your question. That's but. fine. That's fine, Larry. That's important information as well. Folks, Larry Hancock's our guest tonight. If you're just joining us, settle in. Lots of time left. His book is called Someone Would Have Talked, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover as always, folks. Order the book. You won't be disappointed. He's one of the premier researchers for JFK assassination information. And he's got a new book coming out uh, very shortly, actually, that is going to chronicle CIA history as well as assassination attempts and perhaps a connection there with the JFK assassination. Um, so here we go, Larry. Back to Larry. We've got all this track record, if you will, successful, successful track record. Uh, during the 50s, Mozambique, as I just mentioned, was he 54, I think, when that coup took place? I think that, correct, yes. Yeah. And then they ended up with the Shah, folks, and he was a tyrant, and the people rose up against the tyrant, as always. And um, they bring in this ringer, Hayatollah Khomeini, who promises an open and free society. Next thing you know, he clamps down and says, no, guess what, surprise. It's going to be a, a, a strict, strict Muslim regime and uh, following uh, Shia law. Now, Let's go to Cuba, shall we? Uh, 1959, uh, Fidel Castro. As a matter of fact, I'm under the impression now, uh, I was just reading that uh, America actually backed Castro in the early years. Is that fact? Uh, they did back, well, interestingly enough, they backed both Castro and Batista. Uh, Cuba be, being so important to us, obviously you want to know what's going on on all sides. and. Um, Batista had problems. I mean, we, the, the government knew that he was corrupt, and matter of fact, they sent people to talk to Batista uh, and literally tell them if he didn't mend his ways, if he didn't make certain compromises, he would probably be an overthrown. And so at the same time they were doing that, obviously the agency had people that were in contact with the opposition. So we we certainly were not all batista and all anti-castro in the beginning at all and then in the early years there was 
especially among embassy people in in Havana, there was a lot of support for Castro among embassy uh, among embassy staff uh, because he was felt to be a populist rev revolutionary, and his communist leanings were not nearly that apparent early on. Uh, so, yeah, there there was support for he, and but there was also support for Batista. It's like we're going to play both sides of the fence, which Just, hardly yeah. ever works. <laughs> It's kind of like in modern day politics, folks, where you find uh, a corporation giving money not only to the underdog candidate, the potential opposition uh, candidate that may gain power, but also to the incumbent as well. They play both sides of the fence to try and gain favor. So he comes to power. Cuba is now under the leadership, for better or for worse, of Fidel Castro. What happens to turn the United States against Castro? And how does the CIA become involved in trying to take him out? Well, actually, in this case, aside from the the seizure of properties, the uh, interestingly enough, they they did develop an, a negative attitude, especially the financial community early on, because something that's not widely known is Castro seized took a lot of hostages. He took over mines, he t seized staff, and he literally tried to blackmail the American companies that own those properties into making donations to support the revolution. Donations. So probably, yeah, he was not making friends among the Eastern establishment way before the, uh, the government officially said, we don't like you. Uh, um, and they remember those sorts of things. I uh, would think, especially American corporations and corporations anywhere, especially in those days. When did Nixon, uh, you know, Nixon traveled to Cuba, of course. When did he finally take it upon himself to order something called Track 2, which was uh, trying to assassinate Castro? And was Eisenhower aware of what was going on? Well, Eisenhower actually signed an executive order, gave a directive, the same way that, that had been done in Guatemala. These are actually directives to initiate a program of regime change. No pre and all of if you go back and again copies of those directives are available and they they read very they read nicely, you know, it's not that we're going to go kill people, we're not going to do assassinations, that there we're we're going to bend all of our efforts to peaceful regime change. You know, and that's what the president signs and that's what essentially gets authorized as a project. Then it's handed off to the appropriate agencies, and in, in in terms of Cuba, the CIA from the very beginning was the designated point agency, and the reason for that largely was their success in Guatemala. Uh, Guatemala was considered the prototype of the CIA success, not on a much broader scale than it happened uh, in. Iran, because this was over overthrowing an elected right. president, replacing a whole administration, putting a very supportive government of a country in place. It was just, it was kind of like the prototype, and the people who had worked in Guatemala were the heroes of the agencies. They, they were felt to be the guys that really knew how to do things. And the interesting thing is that those are the same people we will see for the next 30 years as the point people not only in Cuba, but in Southeast Asia, and then later in Nicaragua and throughout Latin America. This this group of people who started working together in Guatemala uh, become essentially the cadre that are expected to be able to do these sorts of things. Uh, and some of those folks ended up in the uh, the plumbers union, so to speak, under Nixon. <laughs> Yes, yes, they did. Talking about uh, the Watergate affair, and uh, we're not going to get into that, but just to let you know that these guys is hung together, if you will. And they, we're going to look together, at they sure. E. Howard Hunt and uh, Sturgis and all these guys we're going to be looking at, too. Now, what was the CIA's relationship with the Eisenhower, Nixon, and I say Nixon as well, because we know that under Kennedy, they kind of just took off on their own and had a bad relationship with the Kennedy administration, shunned them completely. Uh, were Nixon and Eisenhower able to rein in the CIA? Were they still pretty much following orders, if you will? Well, that, 
interesting question, Brent, because it's not, that's the way we all perceive it. That's yes. the way I would have perceived it a few years ago. Okay. Um, they didn't what's have different? exactly, what's different is that Eisenhower issued these orders and the CIA went off and in the case of Guatemala, they, Eisenhower really never asked what they were doing. Mm -hmm. He never became operationally involved. It happened fairly quickly. Uh, he didn't get a whole lot of feedback. He was just impressed with how well that they had succeeded. But Kennedy... Can I just interrupt you there, Larry? When an assassination took place, was he not even curious if they had um, actually done it? Like the, the United States administration with the CIA operating? Was he not even curious or he just didn't want to know? Completely just didn't want to know. Really? Uh, completely hand off. Uh, and that's... Unless something goes wrong, See, that, that's the interesting thing. As yeah. long as it's going right mm -hmm. and it's deniable, then no questions are asked. So as long as the guys are succeeding, there's no micromanagement. When the guys start failing, then we start seeing executive involvement. And the interesting thing about the CIA under Kennedy was the CIA was failing under Kennedy, and he was quite aware of it. Uh, one of the key things there is that early on their first failure wasn't in Cuba their first failure was in South Vietnam and early on even even before Cuba the the CIA had been chartered with a series of uh, proactive very aggressive sabotage and co-option operations against North Vietnam and they failed totally and Kennedy pulled that out from under them and gave it to the army. Interesting. And gave it to the military. Well, you recall reading about his interest in special forces Absolutely. and special operations. That was because the CIA paramilitary operation was not producing results. That's and why he brought in the Green Berets. That's why he brought in the Green Berets. Ah, you're educating me here, and hopefully everybody, I'm rooted to this seat, <laughs> folks. Sorry, Larry, to interrupt you. And what we see in Cuba is the same thing happened to Cuba. Again, it's, it's often glossed over, but the first operations against Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, everything before the Bay of Pigs and the Bay of Pigs were entirely CIA paramilitary. Uh, when the CIA needed the Army, they borrowed people from the Army. Uh, they shipped it, sheep dipped them. They brought them over. Uh, after the Bay of Pigs failure, the next projects were not CIA. The CIA was used as a function in the operation, but it was not at the top level. Mongoose, which was the follow on project, was not strictly a CIA project. And by 1963, Kennedy was involving the Army to a much greater extent in his, his projects. and very dis dissatisfied with the paramilitary operations of the CIA. So to answer your question, the difference was under Kennedy, they were failing and Kennedy was getting involved with them and engaging with them. It wasn't that they were going as an agency necessarily going rogue. They just weren't doing a very good job. <laughs> That's interesting. I. I this is a new perspective that uh, I hadn't entertained before now. Was he making enemies during oh, this period? Oh, he was definitely making enemies among the... They thought, and again, from their perspective is, they still considered them to be the, the professionals, themselves to be the professionals, and they considered that he was just getting involved in something he knew nothing about. That his, he had assigned his brother Robert to really be in charge. His Robert had no idea of intelligence operations. So they were hugely intolerant of the Kennedys because, and this is another point that we tend to ignore, if you look at the national intelligence estimates that are prepared from the entire intelligence community, from before the Bay of Pigs, certainly immediately following the Bay of Pigs, all the way to the assassination, every intelligence estimate said essentially, you can't get rid of Castro. Forget it. I didn't he's, know this. He's put put too many controls in place. That he's it's it's not going to happen. Just get over it. But Jack was not going to get over it uh, for a lot of different reasons, and he kept pushing. 
And so essentially the CIA's position was, you're asking us to do something that's virtually impossible anyway. And then when we can't do it, you're trying to run it yourself and you have no clue. Um, that's their attitude towards what's going on. Uh, so yeah, he was, he and, and particularly Bobby, Bobby much more than Jack because Bobby was playing front man for him in Cuban operations. And he was the one who was yelling at people and cussing people out and uh, you know, he was taking most of the heat rather than JFK personally. But it had gotten to the point where JFK was approving all major sabotage operations in Cuba. Now, and this is this and and from the CIA people's perspective, it's sort of like, okay, you want all this to be deniable. And I, I, I read one operational report that was kind of fascinating. They're saying, you want us to really put pressure on the Castro regime. So we've got to do something like disable their total power grid you know we've got to go up and blow up major power stations and you want it to be covert and nobody knows about it how do we do that <laughs> impossible larry hancock folks i told you folks isn't he amazing uh someone would have talked this is book www.nightfrightshow.com just click on the book cover it'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book online we're talking about jfk and the cia if you're just joining us lots of time left don't worry folks just settle in and relax fascinating history of the cia they had templates in place folks for assassination they were very successful then along comes the Bay of Pigs. Now, I should tell folks that are too young to remember the Bay of Pigs, and I'm one of those. But essentially, the Bay of Pigs was set up uh, ex-Cuban nationals uh, who fled Cuba after Castro took power in 1959, uh, came to Miami primarily. They wanted to go back in and take over Cuba. They wanted to go back home and get rid of Castro. So uh, with CIA help, they set up an invasion force of 1,500 people. They invade Cuba at a place called the Bay of Pigs. It failed miserably. Uh, Castro was waiting for them for a whole bunch of reasons. It failed miserably. Um, basically, the way I understand it, the CIA tried to blackmail President Kennedy into sending in uh, American troops, American air support to help uh these cubans the 1500 cubans take over land in cuba uh and actually have a successful operation kennedy said no look it's a covert operation we can't have we can't risk a nuclear uh confrontation with russia who was back in cuba at the time by bringing in american troops american air force we can't do it um the cia actually i i was speaking with ted Sorensen about this and the cia had its own report two weeks before the Cuban uh, Bay of Pigs that said it was bound to fail. It, there was no way it could succeed. So there you have it. So JFK felt he was blackmailed. Is that approximately what you found out as well? That's true. Let me make a couple of minor tweaks to that because Please this do. becomes a very, a key incident. And I, I think this is the key incident, the first key incident actually in the assassination because this is the point at which certain CI officers went into denial. They, what you said is true, the, the military officers charged with the landing essentially went to their boss, a fellow named Bissell, and said, this is not going to work the way you structured this. Uh, and Bissell was personally responsible. What, what Eisenhower had authorized was the landing of a large-scale guerrilla force that would be placed into the mountains and go underground and literally lead a successful revolution against Castro. Under, under the project turned into something that was a full-scale landing with landing craft and tanks. And it's, it, David Phillips, doesn't, who's a well-known sea officer, doesn't say much that you can trust, but one anecdote he has in his book is that when he first was introduced to the project and he was told that they would be using landing ships and putting tanks on the beach, his remark was, so we're doing a deniable operation with tanks? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, where would these people come up with these on their own? Isn't somebody going to think it's us, you know? Um, but... But the problem seems to be, and this is, this has only really been known in the last few years with some interviews that have been done with these military officers. They went to their boss, they went to Bissell, 
and told him and he said no problem guys I know what you need is massive air support I will go to the president and you will have it he went to the president and promised Kennedy he could do it with even less air support oh so this is what happened okay and the guys got hung out to dry and did not even realize it until they were shown certain documents later and now they are on record as saying that they were had by their boss within the CIA and it wasn't Kennedy's fault uh -huh. and apparently he was trying to play some kind of political game but this was the guy that also knew that there was an assassination project in play against Castro and apparently was betting everything on Castro being dead at the time of the landing you know and he lost and he lost Larry we've only got a few minutes left and there's a subject I want to get to um, when we've got only a few minutes left uh, five minutes left but I want to ask you right now do you feel that somehow the CIA was involved in the Kennedy assassination I feel that certain CIA officers were do you want to name names it's up to you uh, probably rather not do that uh, but they would be officers they would be officers at JM wave working with the Cuban exiles and l let me give you this much to identify it and this is this really to, to fast track all of this the point is that after the Bay of Pigs there were certain sea officers that really did not understand the truth of what had happened Bissell himself never explained what he had really done Kennedy didn't explain what had really been happening so there were a whole group of CIA officers from that point on who felt that JFK had betrayed them mm. and had behaved in a treasonous fashion by 1963 when these same officers see officers learned that JFK was beginning personal private back channel negotiations with Fidel Castro and passed that on to their surrogates and essentially told the guys that they might as well not count on going back to Cuba because it was all over mm. you can reach your own conclusion about what would happen next do you feel then it was the CIA that ordered the hit on Kennedy or do you feel it was the Cuban exiles or I, all I, of the above I, I, I can what I picture is a scenario much like what we've been talking about conversations between C, senior CIA officers who know about the Castro negotiations starting to talk about that about other things that Kennedy was doing that they mistrusted starting to have those conversations that you know Kennedy is dangerous Kennedy you know this he's out of control we don't know what he's going to agree to with the Russians next and these conversations start happening among people who already regard him as a traitor those conversations just like in the earlier conversations we start talking about when somebody says he's got to go what happens next you don't really know what's going to happen next and who's going to hear that conversation and who's going to translate it into something real as to happen now because we're talking about October 1963 when Kennedy has authorized the discussions with Castro and Castro has said he wants a quick solution Resolution to the could problem. be a matter of months certainly would be before the next next election what would you imagine would have happened in 1964 if John Kennedy had gotten on stage and announced the Russians were being kicked out of Cuba oh there would have been pandemonium I mean people would have just been rejoicing you know they would have figured in reverse would that the dominoes would have, would have fallen in Latin America you know you have you all of a sudden you've got the biggest revolutionary in Latin America who's pro-soviet is now pro um, West uh, certainly the other regimes we would have thought would have followed right on, on suit now you know someone wise always told me follow the money was there money to be made off this off this hit I call I keep calling it a hit assassination no I, I think again that this is very much more ideological then and that's why I wouldn't call it a hit or an any more than I, I mean several 
several of the when we're, we're talking about these regime changes or whatever there was money on the side there wasn't money involved in the actual assassination uh, no I don't I don't see there and there did not have to be a lot of money involved because you, you're already working with people well one of the things that you've got sure. to remember is you're working with a group of people that for two years have had all the resources that they've needed to go into Cuba and kill Fidel Castro. Yeah. Whether it's weapons, supplies, money. Do they have money? Sure, they have money. They have money in black accounts that you're never going to see. Yeah. Um, you know, so all of that is in place. It's just simply a matter of diverting a little bit of it to go to Dallas. Do you think CIA operatives were in Daly Plaza that day and did they pull the trigger? CIA, CIA officers never pull the trigger. Ah, CIA officers never pull the trigger. That's right. CIA employees never pull the trigger. It couldn't be deniable if they did. That's not the way. The paradigm that's in place for 30, 40 years is in place there. No. You, it, it might be the same. Might there be a CIA officer in Dallas? You bet. Yeah. Uh, is, the, is he the person with the weapon? No way. Not a it just then. doesn't doesn't work that way. They would outsource it again. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I've got to get to JFK Lancer's wonderful, wonderful um, uh, convention that they put on every year in Dallas. Can we speak a little bit about that, Larry? This year, this year we have divided up into several sections. We have a we have a lot of, of very experienced researchers speaking. We'll be addressing an, a series of panels on medical, forensics, ballistics, uh, shooting, the, the very core issues of the attack in Dallas. Uh, where the shots were from, fired from, the nature of the kill shot, what does that indicate about the shooters? Uh, that's one section. Then we have another section that talks about Dallas itself. We have uh, people like Jim Mars, longtime reporter from Dallas who frequented Just on Ruby's show. Club. Yeah, I, uh, people like Ian Griggs, who has spent a British researcher, but spent more time researching Jack Ruby and his clubs and than than anyone. So those people will be talking about the Dallas environment. And, and you'll be and talking Jack. as well. I will be talking. I will be talking about the subject that we're just just talking about is what I I feel the risk, the high risk thing that JFK did that really made it happen. Uh, okay. which we have just discussed, but I'll yeah. go into a little bit more detail. <laughs> Absolutely, when there's more time. And that's something I wish we had more of right now, folks. Our guest tonight has been Larry Hancock. His book is called Someone Would Have Talked, and I urge you all to get this book. It deals with a subject matter that uh, people knew in advance that Kennedy was going to be assassinated, therefore definitely a conspiracy. This just wasn't one lone nut assassin that just did it at a, you know, on the spur of the moment, no question at all. Uh, people that have been listening to this whole series on JFK and the assassination know that now for sure. Easy way to get the book, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover as always, folks, and just order the book from the comfort of your own home or download the shows. All the shows are there for you, folks. This is a volunteer gig for me. I have to pay for everything out of my uh, own pocket. If you want to make a uh, donation, Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll pay for lights and microphones and all kinds of paraphernalia. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. I'm out of time. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Listening to Night Fright and your host, Brent Holland. The time is now. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. Yeah.